McCurtain was no longer in any doubt that he had to mount offensive military operations. Problem was, he had no field hospital, he had no medical supplies, he had an inadequate supply of ammunition. The assortment of rifles and shotguns he had would provide no opposition to a conventional military force. Then on the following day, what became known as the Castle Document was released, which showed that the British authorities were on the verge of suppressing the volunteer movement. This document, however, had been forged by the military council of the IRB in an effort to prepare the volunteers for military action. McNeil thought it was true and responded by issuing his own orders declaring that the volunteers would only take action in self-defense. And when this instruction arrived to McCurtain, he was totally confused. McCurtain was effectively now trapped between two parallel chains of command. On the one hand, he was the brigade commander of the Cork Brigade of Volunteers, answerable to Owen McNeil as his chief of staff. And on the other, he was a member of the IRB, taking his instructions both from the Supreme Council of the IRB and from the military committee. He was in an impossible situation. When McNeil realized that he'd been deceived by the IRB, he cancelled all orders. On Good Friday morning, Owen McNeil sent J.J. O'Connell to Cork with orders giving him complete control of the volunteers in Munster and declaring that all orders issued by Patrick Pierce were hereby cancelled. As O'Connell was on his way to Cork, both Patrick Pierce and Sean McDermott visited Owen McNeil. They informed him that the German armed shipment was imminent and persuaded him no, that it was too late to stop the rebellion. McNeil dispatched new orders to Cork, instructing all volunteers to mobilize. So from the point of view of, of Owen McNeil and the, the volunteer leadership, uh, the whole rising was, was based upon the arrival of, of the arms on the Odd, accompanied by, by Roger Casement, of course, in the submarine. Now, the arms didn't arrive, the ship was intercepted. Casement arrived early, two days early. He had no radio communication with the boat. He didn't know what was going on, basically, and Casement and his companions were arrested when they arrived on the 21st. The Odd then was scuttled. So, basically, the, the, the whole operation was scuttled in, the, in that sense. When news reached McCurtain early on Saturday morning that Casement had been captured and the Odd had been scuttled, his problems began to multiply. Nevertheless, he decided to obey the last order which he had received, in this case, McDermott's order, informing him to mobilize on Easter Sunday. This led McCurtain to respond in frustration. Tell Sean we'll blaze away as long as the stuff lasts. And on Easter Sunday morning, 1,029 members of the Cork Brigade of Volunteers mobilized for military operations. Then at noon, the volunteers formed up outside the Holland companies under the command of Sean O'Sullivan, who marched them over to the West Cork Railway Station at Capwell, where they bought tickets for Crookstown. When news reached Dublin of Casement's capture and the loss of the arms from Germany, McNeil sent yet another order to Cork, cancelling the rising. Believing that the national rising was now completely cancelled, McCurtain took the only option which was open to him and decided to stand down his unit. Sean Murphy, the brigade quartermaster, had been left in charge of the volunteer hall in McCurtain's absence. Murphy was aware that the volunteers all over the county had been stood down, and there was little chance of mobilizing them at such short notice. He decided that the only option open to him was to place the volunteer hall in a state of defense. Returning to the city on Easter Monday evening, McCurtain and McSweeney went to the volunteer hall where they met Mary Perlow, who was from the Dublin Common Amon and she handed McCurtain a note which was scribbled on the flyleaf of a notebook. Signed by Pierce, it said, we start at noon. The problem was, noon had long since gone at that stage. As news of the violence and destruction in Dublin filtered back to Cork, an angry crowd gathered outside the Volunteers Hall on Shear Street. Many people, especially business interests and those with families serving in the trenches, did not want a rebellion to take place in the city. This is very critical in the context of what support McCurtain could have expected to have had if he had mounted some form of rising or insurrection at that particular time. The Lord Mayor, T.C. Butterfield, contacted Brigadier General Stafford, the General Officer Commanding in Cork, and suggested that before the British attempt to capture the Volunteer Hall, 
He should be afforded an opportunity to meet with McCurtain and to negotiate some sort of settlement. They were in a no-win situation. So the Bishop of Cork came to the Moss to try and negotiate a peace treaty whereby it would see no actual physical action being taken in Cork. The difficulty that the Moss had, he told the Bishop, was that if they were attacked, they would stand their ground and defend their hall, but that he didn't intend to actually start any action. While all of this was going on, of course, the, the British Army were actually moving in to surround the volunteer hall. Uh, artillery was deployed on the hills uh, of Drona Braher, and a number of machine guns were mounted in the roof of the malt house, which was directly across the road. So as the week went on, McCurtain's options began to diminish significantly. And by the end of the week, all he could do was negotiate because there was absolutely no prospect of mounting any successful military operation. It was a very difficult time in Thomas Davis Street. On one hand, you had my grandmother with her young family and her elderly mother staying in the house, and yet she knew that things were extremely serious in Shear Street. She knew that the mosque was surrounded, so she was in turmoil at home, and yet she had to keep the home fires burning and keep some sort of normality for the children. As a commander, Thomas was in a very, very difficult situation. If he started action, he was condemning all his men to death. Eventually, in the early hours of Saturday morning, negotiations were finally concluded between McCurtain and the British authorities. Uh, the terms effectively were that there would be no confiscation of weapons, the, no information would be leaked to the press. Uh, there was also the idea of an amnesty then, that, that, that if they didn't take any action, that, that nothing would happen to them. No, the British broke the, the agreement, essentially, as we understand it. The guns weren't given back. The leaders were arrested. There was a swoop um, of all the volunteer leadership. Early on the morning of May the 2nd, the Royal Irish Constabulary surrounded the Kent home and ordered the boys inside to come out and to admit they, they were under arrest and they said never, they would never surrender. A gun battle ensued. Chief Constable Rowe was killed. One of the Kents was also killed, but the remaining brothers were arrested. They were brought to Victoria Barracks in Cork City. They were court-martialed on the 4th of May, and Thomas Kent was executed on the 9th of May for that act of armed resistance. In 1916, obviously, weighed very heavily on my grandfather's mind, and he felt very bad that he had left down the men of action in the Easter Rising in Dublin. But he said, first of all, for those of you that are going to judge, be careful, because you weren't there. But he did feel that he had still made the right decision. So the fact that Cork didn't take part in the Rising, per se, led to a lot of, of sort of soul-searching, feelings of guilt, uh, the pain of Easter, I think Terence McSweeney called it. Now, there was two inquiries in 1917, one by the IRB and one by the Irish Volunteers um, to investigate what had happened in Cork. And the findings of both of those exonerated the leadership of the Volunteers and basically uh, indicated that they couldn't have acted other than they had acted. When we look at McCurtain and evaluate his leadership, he did a remarkably good job. In the first instance, McCurtain received 10 different conflicting orders. He made the right decision on Easter Sunday morning when he decided to demobilize his brigade because he already knew that the German arms shipment from the Aud was lying underwater at the mouth of Cork Harbour. He made a second right decision when he got back to Cork on Monday night because by then the element of surprise had been completely lost. And had he mounted any kind of military operation at that time, the British Army would have dealt with his small force in a very systematic manner. And without doubt, any volunteers who survived that particular bombardment would have been court-martialed and would have been executed, as happened to Thomas Kent. And the other thing that he did was that he retained intact the Cork Brigade of Volunteers to go on and play what was a pivotal role in the War of Independence. If McCurtain had got it wrong 
in 1916, none of that would ever have happened. And then history would be a different story.